only heard of it a few moments ago when you guys called me and told me about it. I'll be looking into it, um, you know, um, as far as I'm able. Um, perhaps one of the few things that um, Republicans and Democrats agree on in this country, unfortunately, is hostility towards Iran. Um, and, um, you know, I'm sure that that's got a lot to do with um, this arrest. So um, we'll just have to see. Of course, uh, hostility towards the towards uh, towards Iran by the U.S. is nothing new to anyone, Bruce. But uh, when you arrest uh, one of your own citizens and you don't give any reason for that, ill treatment has been reported. It's not as if Muslims do not live in the U.S. There are so many Muslims in the U.S. Uh, but. Uh, I don't really think that, that that should be the case where they get arrested when they want to get on a plane. Well, obviously it shouldn't be the case, but um, in the real world it does occur. And um, journalists are in um, sensitive and vulnerable uh, positions. The um, right to know is something that um, everybody pays lip service to and uh, the actual policies of many governments, especially the United States, are just the opposite. Um, the Obama administration uh, excelled in the uh, persecution and prosecution of journalists that it viewed as hostile. And, um, you know, the Trump administration carries on in the same tradition. But... Uh it's very interesting, Bruce. I'm sure, uh, well, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people say America, and I'm quoting this from a lot of people in the world, they say, well, America is the, con is the is a land of the free. You are basically uh, free to say what you want. I'm trying to imagine the reasons behind her arrest. Uh, God knows. I don't know if, for now because we haven't been given any reason for that. She is an African-American. She is, uh, she happens to be Muslims and, uh, a Muslim, that is, and then then she wears the hijab, and then she was traveling in the United States, uh, and then from my own personal experience, and uh, the conversations that we had before, because it's not the first time that she's traveling back to the back and forth to the U.S. Actually, and then she's been telling me that you know her travels to the U.S. Uh, let's just put it this way, have not been without troubles. and But this one is totally new, Bruce. Um, I'm just trying to dig out a reason into it and tr try to find a reason because obviously we haven't been given any reason for her arrest. Which one of these factors that I just named would you say is closest to reality? And the fact that I want you to, to focus, please, uh, isn't that right to be able to express uh, what uh, your mind and then you, you know how you feel about certain things uh, she's a journalist and uh, you know she's she's working for a TV station isn't she free to tell the people of the world or tell her viewers what she thinks what her views are of the of the world events especially the ones that America is also involved only a very naive person would believe that sir um <laughs> That's all I can say. I mean, this is the country that has had a secret warrant out for Julian Assange for, what, seven or eight years? Um, you know, so um, uh, it's, it's just not um, surprising at all that she should be harassed by this government in, in some way. Um, journalists that I know uh, who have rather large audiences well, uh, relatively large audiences on the left um, in the United States. Um, um, they've uh, passed and enforced special uh, restrictions that, uh, well, I mean, many journalists in the United States have been forced to work in other countries. Um, uh, I, um, in, um, in Europe, in Germany, um, in South America, in Venezuela, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, in Mexico, um, because they can't make a living here applying their trade because they've uh, been uh, suspected of not being subservient to um, 
you know, the interests that run this country. Um, and they've gone so far as to make it uh, impossible to get paid um, if you happen to be working for news outlets in uh, Venezuela and Iran, for that matter, um, <laughs> you know, and, and the number of other countries. So um, this is not a surprise. This mm. is par for the course. This is something that uh, journalists who are actually out here on the ground uh, trying to tell the truth as they're able to discover it um, have been uh, living with this reality for some time. And as I said at the beginning, only a very naive person, um, you know, doesn't believe, um, you know, that that this happens. It does happen. This is the world we live and work in. Um, uh, from what you uh, just said, Bruce, I gather that uh, you, and now you correct me if I'm wrong, it would be naive or unwise to think that uh, America has freedom of expression. Is that right? Correct. I mean, it, it's um, uh, uh, the, the non-freedom here plays out differently than in some other places. Um, this is not Colombia, where they simply knock on your door and put a bag over your head and drag you out to the corner and shoot you. It doesn't quite work that way here yet. Um, but um, there is definitely um, suppression of, of people's journalism, of left-wing journalism, of journalism which is not um, responsible to the elite that run this country. There's definitely um, um, an upswing in uh, persecution and the prosecution of, of journalists here. Okay, okay, Bruce, let's just uh, discuss this from another angle, from uh, the angle of, 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 a, of a person of, a, of color. But before I, I talk to you about this particular subject, Bruce, let me just hold you there, because I've been told that uh, um, we have our man in Washington, D.C., who, uh, who is joining us right now. I'm going to bring on air Mr. Colin Campbell. Colin, if you hear me, it's been shocking to me, you know, it's, I, I just heard it in the past few minutes and it's already very shocking, especially in light of the fact that no reason has been given for it so far. Marzio, of course, uh, has been traveling back and forth America, mistreatment at the airport, especially, or other places. She, she, she complained about sometimes, but nothing as major or as intense as that, Colin. No, this is really concerning, especially reports that her hijab may have been removed and there may have been other religious violations that she's been subjected to uh, upon her capture or her detainment, rather. Uh, this is very alarming because it's unsure as to why she's been detained and why she was targeted. Uh, so, again, we're getting some of these details coming in. Uh, we're learning more by the minute, but we're still unsure as to the, as to the depth of what has happened and as to why it has happened. So we're still waiting to hear more information on. Let's just speculate a little bit, Colin. I, I'm not really sure, you know, because we've been tell we've been told actually that you know she's been transferred to a facility in Washington D.C. That's the city where you live as well. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm I'm just curious, and I'm and I'm trying to uh, actually. Um, drag some speculation on that you know how is she because uh, let me just also mention for you to and our viewers that she's been ill-treated at, at the prison or at the facility that she's held right now uh, they have uh, deprived her of halal food that is the food that is allowed by the religion of islam uh, for uh, people and its followers to consume and they they have deprived her this is the this is the first this is the uh, one thing actually that, that we've heard uh, about the situation and the condition of her of her arrest right now uh how bad do you imagine colin uh if you really uh, we are to describe this uh, that as bad obviously because of the things that but how bad do you think her situation sure, sure. might be at this point I don't think that it's going to be much worse than what she's already experiencing. I don't expect this to be some type of 
situation where she's being subjected to waterboarding or something very even more extreme than what she's going through right now. That would be extremely terrifying to even think about. Of course, there's lots of speculation now. We, don't, we are unsure as to why she was detained, what the reasons for it are, what, what are they connecting her to, who authorized this, who's the one who initiated the arrest. There's so many of these things that we don't, we haven't quite verified yet. And so to speculate as to what she may be experiencing now, you really can't, uh, you really don't want to dare to think about anything worse that she's already experiencing, especially when it comes to extreme uh, measures or extreme tactics, rather. Okay. You know, uh, I was basically asking the same thing from our other guest, Colin, uh, that, uh, well, you know, America is famous to be the land of the free, the land of free expression. And uh, yeah. isn't that very ironic that uh, an American journalist who happens to be Muslim, happens to be working in Iran, gets arrested for, for no reason? Yeah, and exactly. And that's what makes it so concerning. Why Does this mean that other journalists, other correspondents could be arrested for unknown reasons or other people that work with Iran or, you know, are descendants from, have descendants in Iran? Who knows what it is? Who knows what that connection is? But the fact that the details about this arrest aren't being uh, aren't being publicized or aren't well known, rather, it makes it a very concerning situation because it's unclear as to what the boundaries are and who else could be uh, targeted for any number of reasons. And so I think that there's uh, there's going to be more outrage about this. Of course, right now it's evening here uh, in in D.C. It's almost uh, approaching midnight. It's after 11 o'clock here. So a lot of people are in bed and they'll be waking up to the news that this is going on and there'll be more outrage and more vociferous people coming forward to demand answers as to what's happening and why it's occurring. Okay, Colin, tell me, what is the case with journalists or with people who happen to work for in other countries and well, Americans who happen to work in other countries and then they mm, are... Are, are detained for, for any reason that I'm saying we do not know as of yet. Uh, what do we expect from the officials? What steps uh, can we expect uh, to come from this moment on? Well, I would think that in the next steps would be some type of formal charges to be placed uh, for Marzia to secure an attorney, whether it's one of her own or one who is provided to her if she is indeed charged with something. If she is charged, she will continue to be detained, I would expect. Uh, of course, there could be uh, something where they say this was all a misunderstanding, where she was detained and some over-aggressive procedure was acted upon and Marcy was, was, was kept. And then they'll say that they acted errantly and they'll release her. Uh, it's really hard to say at this moment because we don't know exactly why they're saying she's been detained. To us, it seems like no reason. For someone who detained her, they will have a reason, whether it's valid or not. That would remain to be debated, but they would give a reason for why they were just you know, uh, keeping her from her own free will. But it is ironic that this happens, especially when we talk about freedom of speech and especially when other amendments in the Constitution are de are uh, defended so fulsomely. And then when these uh, types of situations happen, it makes one wonder what the priorities are when looking at the various amendments in our Constitution, which ones are worth being the most vocal about, which ones can be trampled on without any impunity. These are the questions that are definitely tossed around and discussed when looking at different machinations behind our nation's law enforcement policies, border policies, policies on immigration, and so forth. Okay. Uh, Bruce Dixon in Atlanta, you tell me, please, uh, uh, how much, how much of of, of, of the events that uh, has have been happening during the past two days, and unfortunately it's only today that we learned about, do you attribute to the Trump administration and the uh, situation that has come with it regarding the airports and borders? 
Ah, uh, well, um, the just about everything that the Trump administration um, has done, um, the stage has been set for it, um, and the powers um, legally, if these things are legal, um, were conferred upon um, uh, the federal government during the Obama administration. This stuff is becoming a tradition now, a bipartisan tradition. So um, I'm not really prepared to say what portion of it um, we can um, attribute to uh, you know, the personality or the administration of uh, the guy who's currently in the White House. I think it's a trap that we sometimes fall into you know, um, there's always the old joke about um, the, um, you know, the person who is fulsomely praising somebody in authority, like, like uh, giving the mayor of your city, um, um, you know, credit for the good weather you're having outside. Well, sometimes I think we do the opposite for Donald Trump, is we blame every evil thing on him, um, you know, whether that evil stuff um, originated with his administration uh, or not, it's just become a reflex. So um, we're just going to have to wait and see. Like Colin said, it's um, midnight. Well, it's uh, 25 minutes before midnight now here in the uh, on the East Coast of the U.S. We're just going to have to wait until morning and uh, see how this shakes out. Um, um, that's what we're going to have to do. Okay. Let me put the same question to, to Colin. You tell me your guess, Colin. Um, what do you think about it? If uh, do you really think that this has um, anything to do, or you know, to to what extent can we connect this to the uh, to the to the policies that the Trump administration has been following uh, regarding borders, regarding uh, airports, especially Colin? Let me just uh, also say that you know they've had. Uh, Mm, belligerent policies, let me say, you know, toward Iranians traveling to the to the U.S. or or people who have traveled to Iran within within past within, uh, if I'm not mistaken, within five years of their trip to the U.S. Well, we did recently have the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on a Mid East Middle Eastern tour, uh, definitely beating the drums of po a potential conflict with Iran if it did not comply with policies that he felt the administration uh, wanted Iran to be compliant with. And so you have this uh, this narrative, if you will, that Iran is the next boogeyman, the next nation that the U.S. must conquer in order for there to be peace and stability in the Middle East. And while this is happening, the discourse is slowly being changed about who Iran is, what is the country of Iran about, what's our relationship with Iran, and how this all comes into play about the future relationship that we'll have with the nation that we may not really know a whole lot about. And I think that for there to be these issues coming from the Trump administration is not a surprise. There's uh, there's always a boogeyman. It's always an us versus them mentality. If it's not someone in Iran, it's immigrants coming from Central America or South America. It's uh, if it's not them, it's uh, people who are already in the U.S. who may not, who can't say they're white American, so therefore they can be villainized. There's always different levels of who the boogeyman actually is. If it's not any of those people I've named, it's the media. The media are the problem. And so I think for the Trump administration to encourage its own policy. There has to be someone for the administration to pit itself against, seemingly in the interests of the American people. But meanwhile, be with this as a backdrop, they're able to make money for contractors and make these billion dollar contracts and generate more income and revenue for themselves so that they can reach another level of opulence in American culture, uh, that 1% or the top 10th of 1% that very few of us can really identify with. Uh, Colin, we're both journalists, um, and uh, we know about the situation that this job brings with itself. You know, we are in the quest of truth, or, or we actually follow the policies that uh, we have to uh, in our professional lives. Isn't it scary to uh, 
And I'm trying to actually imagine the situation in my head that this might be the reason why Marzia is is um, is arrested. Because I was thinking that if you're a Muslim, well, we have so many Muslims in America, they don't simply arrest you for walking out of the streets, do they? And, uh, well, she is a person of color. We have so many of them. I mean, I'm just trying to basically cross out the reasons why she might not be arrested for. And this one really stands out, that she happens to be an American Muslim woman journalist working for Press TV. And then you get arrested for that. Isn't that really scary in the eye of us who are journalists? Yeah, of course. Like I said before, it's very concerning because you don't know what the motivations are. Because it's not something that has been proclaimed, something that's been announced, something that's well known, something that's documented, something that's expected. Any journalist working with press or any type of Iranian affiliation could be a target. I could be a target. I don't know for sure. And it's hard for me to know without speculating. Am I a correspondent because I work with Press TV could be arrested for seemingly no reason? I don't know. I dread to think about it. But based on what's happened to Marzia, there is no guarantee that that cannot happen, right? So, of course, this is something that's very concerning to many journalists, I'm sure to some of my colleagues who also reside here in the U.S., um, who've, who've worked with Press TV, uh, what could be the next step for this administration to carry out some type of anti-Iranian agenda and do it consequently with correspondence. One, a correspondent, a member of the media, is already villainized by the administration. Two, Iran is already villainized by the administration. So a person who works as a journalist with a country that is being villainized by the administration would almost seem like an obvious target. It's just that what did the person actually break the law doing? There may not have been anything, but just the fact that there are these two um, two entities that the administration doesn't agree with, that person could be the next one detained. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Colin Campbell, our correspondent in Washington, D.C., um, filling us in with um, his take on this whole matter because, uh, like he mentioned, it's uh, closing to midnight too. Uh, in Washington, D.C., details are very sketchy right now. We, we do not know really why Marzia is arrested. Perhaps we can talk to Colin um, a bit later, some hours later in the morning of Washington to have uh, more information coming out from that city. For, ne for now, let me just thank Colin Campbell uh, for his take on the matter and uh, go back to Bruce Dixon in Atlanta for uh, the next question. Uh, for those of you who have joined us right now, before I go to Bruce Dixon, let me just uh, review the facts. The person you see right behind me on that big screen is Marzia Hashemi. She is one of our colleagues at Press TV. She happens to be working at the same desk that I'm using right now. She is an anchor person. She was mm, taking a trip to America, her mother country. She was born in America. She is an American. She is a Muslim American. And then uh, she was travel uh, traveling in America. We've been told to visit her uh, fatally ill brother. And five weeks about five weeks into her trip to America, she gets arrested in St. Louis Airport. And uh, this happened on Sunday. From Sunday so far, we haven't, uh, we do not know, we have no knowledge of uh, what's happened to her until we were told by her relatives that she got arrested and her initial arrest came on Sunday. And then she was apparently taken to uh, another facility that uh, was in Washington, D.C. She was taken by FBI. We do not know why this is happening. No reason for her arrest. It's midnight or closing midnight in Washington, so we have to wait until the until morning tomorrow to have uh, any idea. We're just trying to speculate. We're trying to bring in people who might be uh, familiar with situations like this, whose opinions really matter in situations like this. So we talked to our correspondent in Washington, D.C., 
uh, Colin Campbell just a few minutes earlier. We've been talking to Mr. Bruce Dixon with Georgia Green Party. Mr. Dixon, as I was uh, saying, uh, I was just trying to cross out the 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 wrong reasons behind this as because obviously we haven't been given any reasons so far i was thinking is it because marzia is is a muslim and i was thinking no because so there are so many muslims in america i really do not know about the situation surrounding muslims especially in their hijab getting on the planes at american airports i'm not really sure about that you please tell me once you start uh, your comments I was thinking that, is it because she's a person of color? Again, the answer is no, because there are so many people of color in America. The only reason I was thinking is that Marzia has got all these situations collectively together, that she happens to be a person of color. She happens to be uh, a Muslim. She happens, she happens to wear the hijab, and then she happens to work for Press TV that is in Iran. Uh, I was thinking this might be the reason. I want to get your comment on that. Sounds very plausible to me, um, you know, what you're saying. Um, like I said, um, bipartisan hostility uh, toward Iran um, is the staple uh, of both Republican and Democratic politicians in the United States. Um, and, um, you know, threats against people where uh, Muslims are about 1% of the population here in the United States. So, um, you know, lots of people have um, Muslims in their family or, 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 or friends or neighbors. Um, so it's, it's entirely possible that, uh, even likely, that if she's a journalist and if she's in the United States um, uh, to see her family, but her day job is uh, working in Iran for Press TV, and um, I know the lady you're talking about. I've I've talked to her uh, for a couple of hours at a time on the phone, a couple of times. Although I don't think we've ever met in person, um, it is um, entirely possible that this is you know some um, 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 you know some police matter that um, that. Uh, the authorities have concocted, um, you know, so um, we're just going to have to find out. We're yes. just going to have to find out. And you say she's been in custody since, what, Sunday? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that's from Sunday. But this is the first, this is the first I've heard of it. Uh, so thank you for um, alerting me anyway. And the reason um, why you know I'll, right now, Bruce, is that we got to know about this just a few minutes before you learned about it. You know, it, she's been actually uh, given um, no access to anything, you know, until uh, maybe about 48 hours after her arrest. And that's only 80 hour, 80, 48 hours after her arrest that her family knows about this. Her family knows about this. We know about it. And, and so, so, so you as well. Uh, but uh, let me just bring in, Bruce, you hold it there, please. Uh, and let me bring in, uh, let me see, Mr. Sam Mehdi Torabi. He is the director of Risalat Strategic Studies Institute. He is joining us from the uh, Iranian holy city of Rom, that's uh, in the south of Tehran. Sam Mehdi Torabi, once again, it's good to talk to you. I seriously didn't want to talk to you about this unfortunate matter, but uh, we're going to have to give some insight to our viewers as to why one of my colleagues is arrested in America. Uh, good morning. Well, let's talk about actually, there's a couple aspects to this matter which we need to separate. One aspect is the personal tragedy that this is, and you have to understand, um, you know, Hanum Hashimi, Miss Hashimi, she's a mm, grandmother, a 60 year old grandmother, who was visiting her brother who is dying of cancer. Uh, she's lost other family members recently and ha didn't have the chance to visit with the family. So this was, a, this was her uh, trip to visit with the family in a, in a very tragic time. And all you need to know about the United States and about the government in the United States, and it's not you know, related to this administration or to the other administration, is that they would arrest such a person at this time. And for 48 hours, we have no idea what's going on. 
So if there is an issue, if if the government in the U.S., if the FBI, if whoever it is that has arrested her, because we don't even know who has arrested her, if there is an issue, then, you know, say what the problem is. But don't keep somebody for 48 hours, you know, with the specifications that I mentioned, uh, and not allow them to have any information. I don't, I think the, the you see, the, there's a problem. The American uh, government, unfortunately, oftentimes works in a bubble. They don't understand that their actions uh, have a certain reaction in the, in the other parts of the world. They, 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 they sit together, they make certain decisions, and they want to, you know, do what they want to do, but they don't realize that when, when the American government arrests a 60-year-old grandmother and doesn't report about it for, for 48 hours, this is a, this is a you know, a, a yeah. public relations nightmare for the U.S. So right now we've just found out about it. You know that uh, Ms. Hashimi, she has friends and fans and, and people who support her across the world. Every continent, in the, whenever people come to visit, whenever she goes to visit, she knows people everywhere on a, on a, on a level where people really, you know, are, are supportive of her because she is a person who, as a journalist, has been very successful and who, because of the things you mentioned in terms of her background, is an example for, you know, maybe thousands of hundreds of thousands of people in the world. So when, when the American government arrests such a person, they have to understand that they are entering into a, a process which my uh, uh, analysis is that they don't know what they've gotten themselves into. And that I think they don't realize what a backlash this is going to cause. So my, if I was going to uh, advise the, the American who, or whoever did this in the States, is I would advise them to very quickly actually, first of all, allow her access to the family, allow her uh, to talk to whoever she needs to talk to, allow her to, uh, you know, if it's even possible, to uh, speak to the media and speak to us, whether it's Press TV or any other media, and the, you know, journalists that are there in D.C. And also, they themselves, if, they, if there is an issue, they need to mention it, because this is not something that is going to be, a, that the U.S. government or whoever it is that has, uh, you know, arrested her is going to be able to control. Mm -hmm. Okay. Matt, you just hold it there. Sure. Uh, uh, of course, uh, that's a very unfortunate event. I'm basically lost for words. I don't know what to say, especially now that Matthew just mentioned that, uh, yeah, these are true. These are facts that um, are, are overlooked. She's, she's about 60. She's a grandmother. And then she was in America after uh, some of her family members uh, had died during, uh, you know, the years of her service here at Press TV. And then she hadn't been able to travel to America, obviously, for each and every one of them. And then this one that she travels to America for happens to be related to um, her uh, terminally ill brother who, uh, who has cancer. And then this unfortunate event happens as if she didn't have the troubles of uh, having to deal with the, with, with, with the tough situation that she was already in. Uh, Matty, uh, I was, I was, I was discussing some of the issues that I'm going to discuss with you too with our previous guests. Uh, one of them would be about uh, the prospect of people who are after uh, alternative journalism in the U.S. They don't want to join the mainstream. Like I'm sure you know better than I. There are so many journalists in the U.S. who do not want to join the mainstream. They want to work for alternative media whether that is free or not whether that uh, where does where, where where it leaves uh, the freedom of expression in america that's an entirely different issue but w what message do you really think an issue like this sends to people potentially after you know independent filmmaking independent reporting or issues like that within the u.s 
Well, you know, Ash, the, the, the point is that this is nothing new. I think some of your guests were previously talking about that. You know, this is not a new thing. Uh, people of color, uh, Muslims after 9-11, you know, we, everybody, all these people know that there is no rule of, uh, rule of law in the U.S., uh, there's a thing, uh, there's a concept, there's a legal concept, which is an ancient legal concept. It's called habeas corpus. It means that you have to present written, in written form. When you arrest somebody, you have to present in written form the reason you have arrested them within a, within a reasonable amount of time. Now, the, the point is simply this. Whatever uh, Ms. Hashimi has done in her, in her professional life, and she's been a very successful uh, journalist, uh, whenever she goes and travels to the U.S., she's invited to speak to various organizations. She has uh, made uh, documentaries. Uh, one of the recent ones she made was about the whole event in Ferguson and the pol police brutality against African Americans. So she's not only a journalist, she's also somebody who has taken her skills as a journalist and used it to make films and to uh, uh, address issues, which are issues in the U.S. And, you know, all this stuff, obviously, you know, if there's going to be people who are upset about this, it's, it's, it's obvious that some people in the U.S. are going to be upset about this. This is not, you know, we, we shouldn't be uh, shocked or, or, or surprised about that. The issue is simply this. When you get to a point when you are blatantly arresting journalists without giving any reason as to why you are arresting them, this is all we need to know about the U.S. If there's anybody who still doubts or thinks that there's some good in the U.S. about, oh, they have, uh, you know, they, they protect human rights, they, they have freedom of speech. Well, you know, on paper, all this is true. But in practice, none of this is true. Uh, the, the issue that we should be focusing on right now, Arash, you know, beyond all that other stuff is, if the government in the U.S. has something that it has a reason for doing this, they need to say it. This is not because we ask them to. This is the law in the U.S. This is the, this is the law that in any country who claims to be civilized and to have the rule of law, you have to mention the reason for arresting somebody. If she is not arrested, if it is some other thing that has happened, we need to know what it is. My guess is that she is not arrested in the traditional sense. My guess, this is my guess, uh, I have no information other than things that I heard that you were talking about. My guess is that they are doing this to intimidate her in order to get her to uh, maybe say something or to talk about something which then they will use to arrest her. This is, I think, what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think what's going on is that they, they are taking her in, they are putting pressure on her, and they want her to maybe say something or, 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 or mention something that then they can use as an excuse to keep her. Now, why would they do that? This now comes to the second part of, the, of, of, this, whole, of, of this whole affair. Okay. Well, on one hand, we have Marzia as a person, Ms. Hashimi as a person. On the other hand, we have now the U.S. looking for every possibility in order to cause problems with Iran. They might be after trying to use her as a bargaining chip for whatever it is they have in their mind. And I go back to what I said earlier, which is... All you need to know is that the U.S. government is doing this with a 60-year-old grandmother who is visiting her brother who has cancer. This is who they're using, if this is the case. I don't know. I'm speculating. It's my guess. If they, are, if they have taken her, take her, take her in and they want to put pressure on Iran through this way, all you need to know is they have done this with this kind of person. Right. Right. Mehdi, hold the line. I'm going to bring in Mr. Ms. Yejide Oronmila. Um, she is a, a U.S. civil rights activist. She's joining us via Skype uh, out of Washington, D.C. Ms. Oronmila, it's uh, good to see you. It's good to have you with us. Uh, um, we learned this morning, only just a maybe a few hours, not a few hours, just maybe a few minutes ago that one of our colleagues here at the anchoring desk on Press TV 
is um, surprisingly and sadly at the same time arrested for no reason in her mother country. Uh, first of all, before we discuss this any further, tell me how you feel about this. Um, I would say that I'm not surprised by that sort of thing as it happens to anybody who um, expresses any alternative views to what the United States um, imperialists have. And I think right now we are seeing that there is a crisis of imperialism that um, is really hitting the United States and all other European countries hard. And so they're cracking down to keep you know, their stranglehold on, you know, oppressed peoples around the world. And I think that um, that it can't be dismissed that this woman who is a journalist and reports for Press TV, um, which happens to be an entity of Iran, is um, not, not a coincidence, obvious, obviously. Um, I don't know uh, a lot about it because I'm just now hearing about it. But I think overall we can see um, just, you know, just like everything that I've been talking about on you know press tv that the oppression um is really critical here for um black and other um oppressed peoples and so that it's necessary to really you know raise a struggle around this and, and many other issues that impact um us here of course uh Mm, there are some facts about Ms. Hashemi. Mm, I'm just going to remind uh, both you, in case you don't know already, and our viewers, uh, our colleague is about 60 years old. She mm -hmm. is an American Muslim woman. She is a grandmother. She mm -hmm. was not in America for fun. She was visiting her terminally ill brother who happens to have cancer. What I'm trying to say is, I'm not just going to paint a gloomy picture, but because I think you know her situation already, without my help, is bad enough in her trip to America. And then the last thing she wants is another trouble. And then um, she, I believe, gets herself in, entangled in uh, some sort of a political game that America is playing with other countries, especially in especially Iran these days. Um, how do you comment on that? How, how are we supposed to see it? Are we supposed to see it in light of uh, something that America normally claims as, and I'm quoting this, national security matters? Or what kind of a threat could a 60-year-old grandmother, who only happens to work as a journalist in Iran, pose to the national security in America? In America? Um, you know, obviously, she, she poses literally no threat. Um, I think that it's important to say that she is coming from Iran and I, and all of the things that has been happening here around immigration and border control and all that type of stuff, uh, I think directly ties into, you know, her being targeted. And also that, you know, I think her being a black woman who is a Muslim um, is, also a, is a, also a key piece as well. Um, I just think that um, overall, like, you know, I think that regardless of, age and situation, what we're going to see more and more now um, through this presidency and probably through another presidency after that is just an increase, like cracking down on people who consider themselves activists or revolutionaries. And so we have to, they even have this thing here called um, the uh, black identity extremist. I'm not saying that she is technically a black identity extremist, but it's, it's one of the categories that have been placed on a group of people, my people, who actually fight for the rights of our people and um, basically identifying us as terrorists. So if that can happen to internally to uh, uh, as, as, us as a group, right, domestically colonized African people, uh, there's no limit to what can happen to anybody who comes in from so-called problem countries. Um, obviously, we don't, you know, as a member of the African People's Socialist Party, we don't, you know, obviously we don't unite with anything that the United States government is doing or anything that um, U.S. imperialism is doing to anybody around the world. We actually seek to destroy um, that. But I think that within this case, what, what was necessary is really to raise up, you know, this sister and, and really fight for her and try to, you know, understand more about what's happening to her so that we can, like, really blast it out. But I think that um, overall, like, this is not, this is not, um, uh, some new thing. This is historically what's happened in the United States when anybody, especially when we're dealing with a crisis 
of, um, of politics and of government, that this has happened. They did it with the Japanese, they did it with the Africans, they did it with the Indians. They continue to target and exploit and oppress, deepen oppression for um, uh, other peoples uh, besides European, besides people of European descent. And I think that this is something that we can see as evidences of, of an ongoing uh, characteristics of the United States. Okay, Bruce Katz uh, in Atlanta, you've been silent uh, for a while. I'd like to get back to you right now and get uh, some reaction from you about what basically Ms. Yajida Oromia said uh, about uh, the rights of the people of color in America and of the fact that uh, Ms. Marzia Hashemi was also uh, a person of color. And of course, um, besides this, I also like you to give me uh, to give me your best speculation as what can happen to Marzia from this um, a moment on. Are we expecting? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. Are we expecting a, a, a trial or, or, or you know, um, bringing charges against her or or how long do you really think you know this is going to take? Let's just go one by one. First of all, on that issue of people of color, and then the rest. Well, first of all, our thoughts. Um, if we happen to be praying, people um, have got to be with um, the lady and with her family um, and, and what they must be going through, um, you know, not knowing um, exactly what, what the deal is here. Um, we're just going to have to be, um, I, I mean, there's an endless, um, there, there are endlessly horrible possibilities um, but what we've got to do is is we've got to um, um, inquire and find out what the situation is uh, before we can do anything. Um, I, 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 I would hope that you'd send me something with the correct spelling in English, how, how she spells her name in English, so that some of us can um, do our own inquiries. Um, tomorrow during the business day and, and try to find out um, what's happened to the lady um, and what, if any, charges there are and and the rest of us because she's got a lot of friends here. So, um, um, you know, we just have to, at, at this point, um, you know, we just have to knock on the doors of the relevant government agencies and find out who has her and what it's all about. Somebody's going to tell us something. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time, Mr. Bruce Dixon with Georgia Green Party. Mm, uh, via Skype out of Atlanta. Um, I really appreciate your time and your intake. That was very helpful in this hard times for, uh, for the Press TV news team. And I hope to talk to you later on a, on a different topic. Uh, I'm going to get back to the holy city of Rome, where Sam Mehdi Torabi, director of Risalat Strategic Studies Institute, is um, on the phone with us to perhaps uh, give us his take and help us open the different aspects of this very unfortunate event uh, uh, that has happened for one of our colleagues. Uh, um, Mehdi, as I just ask our previous guest, you know, her fate, regardless of why she is uh, treated this way, she is uh, mm, taken prisoner or ta taken to that FBI facility. I mean, even the thought of that, that, you know, because you're a journalist, you're an Iranian, you're, you're an, an American, a Muslim who happens to work in Iran, and that's perhaps why you're taken to an FBI facility in itself is very scary. And I don't know what message it really sends to people who want to follow in her footsteps. Like you said, you know, she has fans. She has people that follow her. She has people who, uh, who listen to her speeches. She is invited to, to, uh, to make speeches um, in her own native country. And in Iran, she's, of course, um, an outstanding person, really, you know, both in personal life and the way she deals with us uh, colleagues and then it's really horrible to think that such a person in, 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 in such a tragedy is entangled in such a tragedy right now. I'm really lost for words, Mehdi. You help me with this. Uh, what are we supposed to do right now? What are we, what are we going to 
see in the next couple of hours, in the next couple of uh, days, how, what worse do you really think we as colleagues uh, can do or what is it that we have to brace ourselves for? Okay, Arshan, I understand. You, you're right. It's, it's, it's actually mind-boggling that what's going on. But we also have to, uh, you know, look at this logically and, and see what the processes are. I want to first mention a few things about the legal system in the U.S., Go ahead. Uh, which I think is important. So in, in the U.S., if, uh, some, if, you wanna be, if, if the government wants to arrest you for whatever reason, there's a procedure to do that. What they do is they arrest you, and then they have to announce that they have arrested you and give you the reason that they have arrested you. Okay? Now, let's be clear about something. The U.S., on a regular and as a matter of, of, of policy, does not uh, use the rules, the normal rules and procedures for people who are not American. They say, well, they're not American citizens. You see this, they go to immigration court or they, they send them through the immigration system. And so the people who are not American citizens are, are routinely denied the most basic legal rights in the U.S. when they are arrested. Okay, so we have to remember that Ms. Hashimi is an American citizen. She is protected by American laws and by the Constitution. The Constitution, there's a Fourth Amendment, which, uh, uh, which does not allow the search and seizure without uh, reason. Uh, uh, you know, there is, there is laws as, as it relates to arresting people or wanting to take people in. The most basic matter now that we have to focus on is there has to be information about why and where and what the whole story is. If you arrest somebody and you don't allow them access for 48 hours to their family, this is a major problem. I think all of this would be, we would all feel a lot better if the family had access to her, if she was able to talk to the family, if whoever it is that has arrested her would actually make a statement about it and, 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 and mention certain things, then we would know actually what we're dealing with. The biggest problem we have right now is we don't even know what we're dealing with. They have randomly, she was going from, uh, th from the information that I, that I was reading, she was going from a flight from St. Louis to Denver, where her uh, family lives, where her children live. And in the airport in St. Louis, they take her, and they take her directly from there to D.C. without uh, allowing anyone to talk to her, her to talk to anyone, her to call anyone, or in this 48 hours, allowing her or anybody else to actually understand what's going on, nor do they issue any sort of statement as to what is going on. So... This is a problem legally that they, in the U.S. There's another thing which unfortunately exists in the U.S., and this is, uh, all that I'm mentioning are my guesses. These are, this is speculation. Sure, go ahead. There is another process in the U.S. It's called grand jury, which is, as many legal scholars in the U.S. say, uh, you know, a, a kind of a joke, a legal joke. It's in the Constitution. It's part of the legal history where basically the prosecutor convenes the jury, and then brings in whoever they want as a witness, and is allowed to ask them anything they want. There is no judge present. The, the lawyers are not allowed to be part of the proceedings, the lawyers of the people brought in as witnesses. Uh, the best example of that we see today is the grand jury against Donald, the, the whole uh, Russia um, election thing is a grand jury. So every time in the U.S. legal system, prosecutors, whether they're federal or, or state or local, whenever they get stuck, whenever they don't have uh, 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 evidence to go to a judge and, and start a case, they will convene a grand jury. There is no legal limit on, on uh, what they're allowed to do or aren't allowed to do. They can, they can uh, randomly force people to come as witnesses. They can keep them as long as they want. And this is what they call, you know, rule of law in the U.S. You have this big, huge hole in the U.S. legal system called the grand jury, which basically suspends all constitutional and legal rights that anybody would have. It suspends the usual uh, uh, legal procedures that, are, uh, that govern a court where you have a judge, where you have rules of procedure, 
where you have uh, rules as it relates to the defense and the defense being able to view whatever uh, things are being, you know, um, presented against the, def- against the, 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 the person brought to court. All of this is suspended in this legal thing they called grand jury, which is basically the prosecutor bringing in people, showing them evidence, and saying, well, what do you think? Is there enough evidence to indict this person? So, again, this is all speculation. I, I have no information, so don't quote me on this. Don't say that I, that I said that this is the case. I'm simply saying that hmm. you have procedures in the U.S., which the government, especially after 9-11, has, has routinely been using to sidestep the Constitution, has been using to sidestep and to, to, to get around all the legal uh, uh, protections that Americans and, and people in the U.S. would have normally if they weren't, uh, you know, if the government wasn't using things like a grand jury or uh, the laws that came after 9-11 in terms of getting around the Constitution. All of this in, in the name of, you know, national security or in the name of whatever, whatever thing they want to make up, uh, whatever reason they want to, to, to give. And so, uh, again, I repeat, I'm speculating, if, if it's such a situation where basically the prosecutor has decided they're gonna, she's, he, he's going to take her in for whatever reason, this is a major problem. We, there, there has to be pressure put on whoever it is in the U.S. to actually come out and say what they are doing. This is the number one uh, task that we have to do right now. Is there has to be public pressure on whoever it is because we don't even know who we don't even know who it is that has arrested her. If it was a federal situation, it's either the FBI or it's the U.S. Marshal. U.S. Marshals are the federal police of the U.S. So there needs to be pressure from everybody who knows Ms. Hashemi, whether it's in the U.S., whether it's in, in Iran, whether it's anywhere else in the world where she has many, many thousands and thousands of fans and followers and people who respect her and, and people who look up to her and people who uh, use her and see her as an example of a successful uh, a woman who has been able to uh, live a very successful and dignified life as a journalist and as a mother and as a grandmother. Everybody has to put pressure on whoever it is in, in, in the U.S., in Washington, D.C., to actually say what they are doing. Mm-hmm. Once that is done, we will know what the next step has to be. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. Just hold the line. Uh, I'm being told sure. that uh, my colleagues have prepared... Uh, um, uh, a little picture, a little actually, a, a graphic work for uh, which contains information about uh, Ms. Hashemi. We're going to watch that together, and uh, I'll be back with you uh, after a few seconds. Let's just watch this. That's uh, Marzia Hashemi and uh, uh, some of the facts about her that uh, uh, was arrested uh, early uh, this morning. Uh, actually, early this mo- not not this morning. I should say that you know she was arrested on Sunday. We learned about her arrest only this morning over here in Tehran. Uh, I'm being told that we have other guests uh, to join us and discuss this ma- issue a little bit further. With but uh, before I go on, I'm going to bring in Ms. Yejide uh, Oromnila, uh, a U.S. civil rights activist out of Washington, D.C., to uh, talk to us once again via Skype. Yejide um, Oromnila, uh, of course, you know, we have this situation right now. There is basically, uh, uh, I don't know, you tell me, is there anything that we as colleagues or, you know, what kind of pressure do you really think uh, 
uh, can we um, uh, uh, can we use or what kind of things if you were in this situation given that you're a US uh, civil rights activist yourself but you're in that country we're in Iran what is it that can be done about it from here yeah I think one of the what we I'll just tell you what we've done in the past many of our colleagues have been arrested is that we do a phone in uh, we and, and the international is is the best too. Like we need to have calls that are coming into whatever agency is taking her, just to let them know that we are watching and we're monitoring it. And so if you have international callers call in, if you have people from the United States, wherever we can get people to call in. So we need to have the agency's information, and we need to have um, the the direct contact of who we need to call. We need to have her her number if she has one, all the information that we can gather about her, um, you know where she is, who has her, and 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 make sure that we can draft something up that will let people know this is what you should say when you call. That's one thing. I think another thing that we um, can do is that the more that we learn is that we have to publicize it. And obviously you have Press TV here that will has the um, ability to do that, but also, you know, tagging in other organizations and individuals who, who obviously know her and create some sort of social media outcry around it. I think the more people who have eyes on her, the better, um, because we already know that, uh, you know, it's not um, it's not ridiculous to think that something harmful could happen to her. So if if they know that no one is looking or nobody's responding, so I think definitely you know flooding their phone lines is going to be one way um, mm-hmm. to really make sure that they know that that she's being looked after and that people are demanding to know what's happening to her to get some sort of response. Uh, emailing to flood the emails of whoever um, or whomever that can make some decisions. Um, I mean, I think it's really critical to to really make sure that they know that we're watching so that we can keep her as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'll get back to you, Yajida, a little bit later. Let's, for now, let's bring in um, Mr., uh, I better say Dr. Randy Short. He's a historian and human rights activist uh, who... uh, happens to know Ms. Hashemi very well, who is, uh, has actually traveled uh, in the past to Iran, who knows some of us in person, and who's better than Dr. Short to join us right now to basically share these moments with us and give us his understanding of this whole matter. It's, uh, let me just mention that it's uh, close to um, um, 12.30 a.m. in Washington, D.C., where Dr. Short is joining us from. It's pretty late in that part of the world, but uh, um, due to the importance of this matter, uh, we are bringing these people who are very, very helpful to our broadcast right now to come on and uh, give us their take of this whole matter. Dr. Short, you're on air, please. Uh, I am uh, here to uh, express my anger, my disgust, and my revulsion at the illegal arrest and uh, summary uh, detention and uh, and wherever she's being detained in communicado of my dear friend and I believe distant relative Marzia Heshmi. Uh, the last time we were conversing, uh, we have a common surname and we talked about uh, looking and seeing if we ended up, of all things, being distantly related. Marcia and I have been friends for nine years. I've traveled in Iran, and I've traveled throughout the United States with Marcia. I have worked with Marcia on three documentaries, one of which I believe was material that they may have taken from her. She came to the United States a few weeks ago to visit her brother who is suffering from uh, cancer. He works in an area of the United States in Louisiana where they have a lot of environmental racism from the pharmaceutical, or should I say the petrochemical industry there. As well, she wanted while she was here visiting her grandchildren, her family in Colorado, she wanted to rekindle ties with friends we had made from a documentary we did in 2014 that was released in 2015 called Jim Crow, I'm sorry, Dred Scott Nation. And she was returning to Ferguson and the greater St. Louis area to talk to people about the uh, racial terrorism, lynchings, 
and uh, killings of uh, people. So I'm not surprised. Uh, I was thinking about her uh, early this morning. I have a picture I've already put up on Facebook. I kept thinking about her. She was supposed to call me back, but she gets so busy. And uh, I went into WhatsApp thinking I might be able to call uh, Marcier. And I see something from a friend, an Iranian friend named Reza, uh, saying that Marcia has been arrested and she's disappeared. And it's, forgive me, I'm a little angry because two years ago, just about two years ago, Marcia and I were in St. Louis together to commemorate uh, a genocide of up to 5,000 African Americans who were murdered in East St. Louis in 1917 by the U.S. Army and uh, white racial terrorist mobs. And as Marcier and I had to leave out of the same gate, uh, my flight was later. I didn't know when Marcier was leaving. When I got to the gate, there were 50 people there, armed people, to harass Marcier. And I la later learned she and Cynthia McKinney were there at the same gate. I was so nervous because I had been uh, from work with Marcier. Uh, we had we've done several things. Um, Marcier is responsible for the Trayvon Martin case being internationalized. She's also responsible for helping me expose the Ebola, Ebola booty bugio biological uh, testing, illegal non-consensual testing that killed thousands of people in West Africa which landed me on the terrorist no-fly list for three years. And uh, when I saw all the people at the airport, uh, this is in July of 2017, I thought they were going to get me. And so I'm thinking I could hide, I hid. And it turned out they weren't looking for me, but it turned out they had all of these people for Cynthia McKinney, and Marzia Heshmi as if they're a danger to anyone. And uh, total overkill. And uh, what I haven't heard other people mention is that Marzia Heshmi is like myself, uh, what we would call African indigenous. Uh, we are of African and Native American descent. And people don't need a reason to pick you up, to kill you, to stab you, to jail you, to deny you housing or your rights. You're blessed if you have them, but uh, you shouldn't be surprised if you don't have them. And this is what Marseille was looking at. In particular, she was in New Orleans and she wanted to do more travel, but I don't think she was able to do that. And uh, normally when she travels, I know this from our first documentary, The Facade of the American Dream, that Marcy has to be careful because people want to take uh, her 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 work and prevent her from talking about issues that matter to the rest of humanity. And so um, this isn't just an harassment of a Muslim woman, it's harassment of a black woman or a black indigenous woman. This is also a harassment of journalists. America has become a place where journalists who tell the truth aren't necessarily safe. If you follow the Clintons, there are a lot of people who are talking about the uh, the uh, sexual trafficking of children and the rape, molestation, and organ harvesting of black children in Haiti. People are ending up dead. Reporters are disappearing. Uh, I live here in Washington no more than one mile from where Seth Rich was killed in 2016. In fact, I was on the same street. He got killed on the street I grew up on initially in Northwest Washington. So journalists and people that tell the truth can be harmed in this very, very paranoid and authoritarian climate of uh, this surveillance, um, this uh, surveillance state or the full spectrum surveillance state that uh, we have here where a lot of people are under a lot of scrutiny, uh, their emails, their phones. So what Press TV and RT, different entities that have been informing the American public in as much as we cannot trust a lot of our uh, so-called mainstream media. 
there's now been a pushback against people like Marzia or our, our dear friend. Remember Serena Shim, how she was murdered in Turkey? This is what I'm thinking about. And so <laughs> I don't know, I'm upset. I don't want uh, anything bad to happen to her. I don't know what to say, Dr. Short. You know, I'm, I'm quite in a state of shock myself, you know, having learned about this only uh, a few hours ago when she was uh, taken into custody days ago. And that's very unfair, let's just put it this way. But, uh, she's supposed to well, call me back. It's amazing. But what we can do something to help Marcier. What is in the hands of uh, uh, your press tv and i've said this on press tv you have an incredible instrument to change the world it it can be fine-tuned in this case i would love to see the supreme leader tweet marzi hashimi's name i'd like to see uh all the shia the ummah of shia and sunni muslims and black americans and others demand that this stop and not only this um we need to demand that the covert war against Iran stop. The funding of terrorist groups that hurt people in Iran stop. The illegal provocations against Iran stop. The starving of millions of people in Yemen stop. The funding of terrorism against Shia Muslims stop. The ending of pitting Sunni and Shia Muslims against each other stop. The terrorism in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza, stop. We have to stop this. I understand. I understand your feeling, Dr. Short. Uh, really a, a, a limbo here uh, in Press TV as well. You know, we have been given very little as to what has become of our colleague. You know, we just know that uh, she was arrested two days ago. She has been, and worse than that, is that uh, she's a Muslim woman and had her hijab removed. I'd like to uh, put this question to uh, one of our guests, but before that, let me just say goodbye to uh, uh, Ms. Yejide Oromnala, uh, a U.S. civil rights activist who joined us uh, via Skype out of Washington, D.C. Ms. Oromnala, I really appreciate your time to have joined us at this late uh, time of night. Um, um, really cherish your comments. Uh, and put the same question to uh, Mahdi right now. Mahdi, you're a Muslim yourself. You know what it means to a Muslim woman to wear a hijab and uh, you know what it means to have her removed by force. What I'm trying to say, Mahdi, is that if you have well, I'm being told that we apparently have uh, do not have Mahdi Torah be with us. If we can get, um, have him back, that would be good because I would ask him the same question. But why not put the same question to Dr. Short in Washington, D.C.? Uh, Dr. Short, you are probably uh, one of the closest people to Marzier from among the people that we have been actually uh, contacting since this morning. Uh, you know her pretty well. You know that her hijab, you know how important yeah. her hijab is to her. And, yes. uh, and basically, you know how important hijab is to any Muslim woman? Yes. Now, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you think, as uh, American authorities, if you think that you should arrest a person for any reason, whether believable or plausible or not, that's, that's a totally different issue. But the fact that you remove the hijab of a Muslim woman for any reason, I really don't... Do you, uh, let me just not say anything about this. What do you think about this? How hard must that be for, for, uh, for any Muslim woman and for Marzia? And the mistreatment that she's been getting, no, regardless of what she has done or what the problem is. Okay, she hasn't done anything, first and foremost. And uh, we're supposed to have freedom of religion in this country. I need to make you aware that about half of my family is Muslim here in the United States. And uh, to me, it's just a complete disrespect. But uh, we have to understand 
in this country where you can have people publicly stab and kill black women and barely be punished. There's been these cases aren't even reported. Uh, that this is not of a great surprise to me, but I know Marcia, and I must say this about her and her, her dedication to being a great Muslim woman, with the exception of a major gust of wind at the ark uh, and St. Louis, I've never seen her hijab not be in place. Okay, that's how she is with wearing and keeping her head covered, which is something that is uh, required of Muslim women, and she honors that faithfully. So this is to disrespect her. This is to disrespect Muslim women. This is to disrespect black women or people of any faith, this is, it's the same kind of disrespect that the sanctions do, where medication and important parts for uh, air travel are denied. It is a way of demeaning and humiliating. It would be like serving uh, pork chops during Ramadan and the uh, fake when you break your fast. It is saying, I don't respect you. I don't respect your holy prophet. I don't respect Sunnah. I don't respect the Hadith. I don't respect the five pillars of faith because I don't have to because I have a gun and I have the arbitrary right to mistreat you because nothing will be done about it for any number of reasons that you're associated with Iran. You are black, you're a Muslim, you're a woman. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Short. Please uh, hold the line for us. I'm going to get back to you. I'm just told that uh, we're joined uh, by Ms. Mariam Ozarcher. She is uh, a colleague and uh, close friend of Marzia's who um, is luckily jo joining us right now at the studios. Uh, Mariam Ozarcher, first of all, before we uh, dig any further, tell me how you feel about this. She's going to come home. Marzi is going to come home because she's American, born and raised, but she belongs to us too, and we're waiting for her. We were doing her spring cleaning. We have, we had dusted the shelves. We had rearranged the drawers. We had bought her some drawers. It was supposed to be a surprise. She wasn't supposed to see it on TV when it's halfway done, when everything is a mess, because pretty soon in Iran, it's going to be the Iranian New Year, and we were preparing her house. And we were not waiting for this, and neither was she. And we just don't understand why, like what happened. Neither do we, obviously, you know. We've been actually trying to uh, dig out some information. As you can imagine, you know, it's late in Washington, D.C., where she is held uh, uh, in um, some detention facility, I believe, where she was taken by the FBI in the, uh, er, in, in, um, on Sunday, and it's very interesting, interesting and sad at the same time, that we only heard about this today and that only through her family. Well, actually, what happened was I was talking to her okay. as she was, you see, she, she had already entered the U.S. She had been in the U.S. for a while, right? I know. She was in Denver. Then she went to Louisiana to see her brother because her brother has cancer, and she was so worried when she was in Iran that, God forbid, she, he passes away and she won't have a chance to see him again. So she went to see her brother. And then the last thing I know is as she was driving to St. Louis, it was snowing. And then, and then she was in the airport with the TSA people. And she was just laughing and joking like, yeah, they're all surprised how many people are checking me. Like, whatever, who cares, you know, like being all jolly. And then she said, sorry, got to go. I'll, I'll call you back. And that's the last thing I heard from her. And then what happened a few hours later? I get a message from Sarah, so that was at 12. I get a 12 hour time, 12 hour time in Iran. And about 4.15 a.m., I get a message from Sarah that they took mom, I don't know what to do. And I didn't know what to do, obviously. So I just, we, we just braced ourselves for what's, what's about to come. And then for two days, we were trying to decide, what do we do about this? Because obviously, when you make an issue political, and of course, she is a political person, she's so much for justice, any movement for justice, pretty much anywhere in the world. But we just, we didn't want to make it political because we're more selfish. We want her back for us, not maybe for the rest of the world. And 
the last and then for the last two days we have been just debating with the lawyers with 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 Marzia with her you know they have assigned her a lawyer and he he was and nobody was letting us talk to her nobody was telling us where she is we couldn't find her anywhere we couldn't talk to her and then for two days we thought okay let's let's try and solve it you know and they like she will they found they were looking for people in the u.s sarah and her children basically and they they wanted to they and 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 they were they just wanted to solve it in the u.s they didn't want it to get too big because we wanted we wanted her to be safe and and we just want her co to come back here I, I know she's american but this is also her home so we were just waiting for her to come back and then just today just early today sarah calls me and she's like i just talked to mom and she has tell told me these things so this is what she has told me and this is what bothered me the most because Marzi is a Muslim woman and ever since she has converted her head has been covered her arms has been covered and she feels bare without her cover you don't see Marzi outside without a scarf on the inside yes we have the Islamic concept but on the outside no and they have forcibly removed her scarf they had made her take pictures without scarves with her arms bare and then now in the prison, all she has is a t-shirt. Her arms are still bare. Her, her head is being covered with a t-shirt. She has her own scarf, just give her the darn scarf. And she hasn't been fit for two days because they gave her bologna sandwiches because apparently that's what you feed Muslims. So she asked for bread, like plain bread without bologna, and she was denied bread in prison for two days so she is hungry she is but i don't think she doesn't care about that what i think what's really getting to her is the scarf the arms and she has been chained and shackled what is this slavery again so so basically that's what we found out this morning and we have been telling people because that's the only option now we have we, we want people to po to po post messages as much as they can hashtag pray for marzia hashemi hashtag free marzia hashemi this needs to get out we need to free her we have to free her we're waiting for her home and we're gonna finish that spring cleaning by the time she's back home i promise it'll only take me two more days that will be enough time for her to get on the plane and come back to Iran because she belongs to us too. We're waiting for her here. Thank you. Any um, other questions? Of course, of course. Uh, I understand your feeling. You know, it's totally understandable from the point of view of a of close family friend. That's also understandable. And in the, in the, from the point of view of colleagues, um, we feel the same about the situation of her arrest, especially touching moment uh, and. Uh, I was just trying to imagine the situation in my head that uh, you are, you are Marzia Hashimi. She's an incredibly kind person. And uh, uh, having her scarf removed after, being, uh, after wearing it for such a long time, such um, a devoted Muslim woman she is. Uh, and she's mm. always respected people's opinions. She has people in her family. She's a convert. Her family are mm. Christian. And I mean, Christians cover in the church too sometimes, but she she has perfect relationship with her family, even though they don't cover. She doesn't tell people, oh, you have to cover. And, and, and people don't get to tell her, oh, you don't get to cover, you know? That's, this is ridiculous. And why put her in chains? The only thing she's a danger to is injustice. That's the only thing. So mm. if that's what they were going for, great. But you, d you don't need to chain Marcia. She's the, the sweetest, most loving, she's the most fun-loving person I know. Like all the trips that we, tr we, we took together, all the different places, she loves food and culture and lean on me. I mean, like music. I mean, where, where, I, I'm sorry, carry on. I don't know, I totally understand. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I have been, been feeling, you know, since uh, early hours of today when we learned about the news of her arrest that unfortunately got to us. Uh, a little bit late and that's not on us that's on that's, the on, that's on me and i accept the responsibility but but you know what we we had to because she also has you know we, we were told not to we were told not to make it international because we thought it would take
take longer for, for her case to be you know, over with because they have no evidence. They haven't offered anything. We keep asking, what, what are you keeping her for? She's American. She has an American passport. She came in the country. You didn't say anything for like, what, two weeks now? And then she traveled from Denver to Louisiana. You still didn't say anything. Now she wants to travel back from Louisiana, from St. Louis to Denver, and you arrest her. And then why take her to Washington, D.C.? Like, w w I, I don't understand. Like, and so, so this, is, this is really not clear. There wasn't anything explained. And in those conditions, why weren't even, like, she wasn't even allowed to talk to us. I, we, don't, we don't understand this. There, were, there, have, there has been no warnings, you know? And she's like, you know, American born and raised. Like, I don't understand. I, I realize the US is like the fifth most dangerous country for journalists right now, according to Forbes at least. But, but, but w w I, like, we, we were not prepared for this. We were not prepared, even, even when they arrested her. We were not prepared for her to have been treated like that. And let me tell you, Marzia, she gets palpitations. And I've had to take her to the hospital because the palpitations can last for hours. And if anything happens to her because of the palpitations, because they don't if they don't provide her with medicine, because they're not feeding her, and God knows she's probably exhausted, but I know Marzia. Marzia is the strongest woman I know. She's the strongest black woman I've ever met. She's the strongest Muslim woman I've ever met. She's the strongest woman I have ever met in my life. And the only thing that's really bothering her right now is, the, is not being covered because she always covers. And she covers and, and, and chains and shackles for Marzia? What, what are you, I mean, she has three grandkids. What are you gonna answer to her grandkids? What are you gonna answer Tahereh? Tahereh is three and a half years old. She was waiting for her grandma to go home. She was waiting to see her. What are you gonna answer? And wh why did you, I, it's just, it's beyond me. We, we did not expect this. We were waiting for two days. We were like, oh, it's calm, you know, she's in, fine, she's in prison, but chains, shackles, pictures without the scarf you know she's a Muslim she has her own scarf you don't need to do anything just let her keep what she has on mm. <sighs> yes I totally understand your feeling uh, uh, Maria Mozarcher um, I'd like you to stay with us uh, while I'm bringing in uh, other guests into this uh, TV broadcast I'm joined by Mr. Jason Onru he is a political analyst uh, and an observer of political matters who is joining us uh, via Skype, I believe, from Ontario. Uh, Jason Andro, it's always good to talk to you. I'm, um, I'm very glad that actually we got to uh, uh, talk and connect to you at this moment because it's one of those very important moments for a political observer. And I'm going to put... Uh, political questions to you. I mean, like, first of all, before we actually go to the political aspect of things and, and why is this happening, I want you to tell me how you feel about this whole thing. This is frankly absolute BS. This is this is this is the United States essentially taking out their impotent rage on Iran. Uh, there is no doubt that this is politically motivated. I mean, Hashemi has been uh, a tremendous voice for speaking for the voiceless and people who have been marginalized in society: uh, women, Muslims, the Palestinians, etc. And this is the United States, the, the the great power of the world, demonstrating how afraid that they are of this voice i mean this is this is the kind of thing that happens to anybody who do it speaks out against what the United States does. For all their military might, for their $21 trillion war machine, they are afraid of this woman, this woman with three grandchildren. And I, I think that this largely speaks to oh, what a, a kind of cowards they actually are, that they can stomp away to uh, uh, as many countries as they want, commit as many wars as they want, kill millions of people, tens of millions of people. But if some if, if this woman who, who disagrees with their foreign policy steps into their country, it's now some kind of federal offense, and they have to they have to shackle a grandmother. I mean, w w what does that say about the United States? That was absolutely wholly unnecessary. It, it, she, it, she, she's not a big, a big you know brute like I am. No, she's just 
you know, a regular grandmother. She, she, she's not violent. She doesn't have, and I mean, I, I've spoken to her on, on many occasions, met all of them, you know, right here on, on press TV. She's never come off as, as terribly, uh, you know, terribly aggressive, uh, certainly spirited as you would get out of someone who cares about what's going on, but nothing that would indicate that she's any kind of a danger. I think that this is also partly the United States uh, sending a message to Iran. I don't think Think that it's any kind of coincidence that they just happen to, uh, you know, target someone who is a journalist and an anchor, someone who works for the state broadcaster. I think they're also sending a message in that regard. Oh, look, I, I, I think it's really. I don't know, maybe it's a coincidence, but this comes right after Iran launches, you know, a satellite into into space, and then all of a sudden they make this kind of uh, seemingly politically motivated arrest. I mean, if, if she had committed a crime, they'd be saying right away why she had been arrested, what she was being charged with, and meeting with her lawyers on that right away. But they're not. They're standing there, uh, you know, twiddling their thumbs. Uh, trying to make things uh, terrible for people, not letting people know what's going on, not giving her access to her family, essentially trying to carry off a kind of psychological torture. And I think that this speaks uh, very much to the kind of mentality that the United States has right now when trying to deal with this whole the, the situation with Iran. This is, a, frankly, this is, a, in a manner of speaking, I, I think a terrorist kind of tactic. They're trying to intimidate. Why Why pick someone who's a journalist? I mean, are there no no dangerous people that they could possibly lock up. There's no one who has a history of violence or something like that, but they have to specifically target someone who is, uh, who has spoken out against injustice, who has spoken out against the crimes of the United States, the crimes of U.S. imperialism and other Western countries as well, and they certainly did tend to take this person uh, specifically and, and treat them in this kind of way. So I think this is highly politically motivated. I think that this is, um, they're probably, I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up trying to hold her hostage for uh, someone who was arrested in Iran for, or some kind of U.S. citizen that was arrested in Iran for whatever reason it was, and I, you know, this is the kind of thing that they're they're going. You know, th th I think that they're probably going to do. I mean, I don't have any evidence, but this usually tends to be the case in this kind of s situation. What they, they usually do, and I, I think that it's it, it, it's 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 a, a terrible injustice. There is no need to do this. I mean, why would you just rip off someone's headscarf? It it, it, it it's not any difficulty for them to just let her have the headscarf. It's not a weapon. It 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 it, it can't hurt anybody. It, it it's just an intentional act. Of disrespect, the shackles on someone who doesn't have any history of violence, who has not committed an act of violence against a TSA agents or the police or the Department of Homeland Security or, frankly, anyone as far as I know, it's not necessary to put shackles on them. It, it's it's completely meaningless. This is just this is just uh, it's seeming almost an intimidation tactic. I mean, the United States has no qualms about. Our, arresting uh, Muslims on the most spurious of grounds, if there are even any, and then end up locking them, you know, indefinitely in various CIA black sites, you know, across the world, you know, f for just their own political motivations, then end up letting them go years later uh, without having any kind of a charge. So I think this is tremendously politically motivated. This isn't just, a, 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 you know, an aggressive act against someone who is uh, speaking in the spirit of those who are oppressed around the world. But I think this is also definitely trying to send a message to Iran that that you know even outside of all their legal constructs, outside of all their their uh, ideas about sanctions and uh, you know uh, uh, nuclear deals and whatever, they're still going to carry out these kinds of things. And I think that it's not a coincidence that it happened to someone in the media, someone who is uh, a broadcaster, someone who is uh, very much a voice. And I, I think that speaks uh, volumes about what they've been doing here. Okay, Jason, just. Uh, mm just hold on there because i'm going to bring in mr randy short uh, dr randy short uh, to join us once again via skype out of washington dc uh dr short of course uh, you're a historian you're a human rights activist yourself of course uh, marzia no exception a prominent character within the media and without um bringing about different uh, view uh different aspect and, 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 and a different dimension to the news that is coming, especially that is coming from uh, the U.S., given the fact that she was an American herself. And then she, uh, on numerous occasions, she described herself as, uh, as, uh, uh, as oppressed 
uh, in America. I'd like to take uh, your take on that, if you're still with us, Dr. Short, I'm not really sure. If you're still with us, please answer me. What message do you think? Uh, the arrest of a person like Marzia sends you as a person, sends the likes of Cynthia McKinney, sends uh, all the people of color in America who do not join the mainstream, who want to be independent, who want to see matters differently, whether they are right or wrong. Well, uh, I remember when I went to Iran and when I returned in 2014, uh, thanks to Marzi, I was detained for about five hours. And I think some of my money was stolen. Um, and they, they went through all my things. And uh, what's, what I get from this is that you've got two things going on, if not three. Let me give you one. There's always the issue, you can say she's American, but you have to say what kind, okay? She is a black indigenous American who was married to an Iranian, okay, man who has children who are both Iranian and of course the African indigenous mix. And so she represents the intersection of Islam and the African indigenous culture and struggle and she's very committed to it. You will find that she's uh, in a long line of people. Uh, Dr. W.B. Du Bois was harassed and abused by his government because he had relationships with people in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, uh, or also called Twame, Kwame Ture, had problems with the government and harassment. Malcolm X had this. Paul Robeson had this. Marcus Garvey, who's a Jamaican national, but he came to the United States, has this problem. What happens in the continuum is due to the oppression of the original people of which I am. I'm a descendant of the people that were in Jamestown before the Europeans came, all right? This is a, the mu fundamental fraud in American history is this fiction that everybody came here on a boat and slave. There were people that looked just like me before Columbus got lost. So we have a 500 year struggle for our dignity, for our land, for our identity. And uh, Islam has a fundamentally challenged to many dimensions of the Anglo Zionist American con control uh, construct or complex. It has a different take on the uh, history and legacy of uh, Prophet Abraham. It has a different take on the state of Israel. It has a different take on geopolitical realities. And when you get a person like Marzier, who brings being from desegregating schools as a little girl, going through the racism that she went through in Louisiana, a state where out of every so many, say every 100,000 people, you have a minimum of, of 700 or more people that are incarcerated, where you have a, literally slavery that never ended in, in Louisiana uh, and many places in the country, that Marche brings that with the politicized Islam that comes from Iran. You have to understand that 40 years ago, Iran changed modern history when they got rid of the Shah. The whole world is trembling at this Islam that is modern, that understands technology, that is both cosmopolitan but rooted in the jurisprudence of the, uh, the people in Qom. And so Marcia is like a crossroad of very, very, very powerful uh, streams or strands of struggle and she integrates and weaves them well. And that makes her very, very challenging to people. And what Marcy has done with her craft as a journalist, is she has brought people together and she's found a way to reach people across race, religion, gender, uh, and, and to critique and to speak truth to power and to expose evil and injustice. 
And this isn't something that people like. We, most people don't understand the particular in American history. We had uh, codes, black codes, laws and, and regulations and customs, where in particular, even now, if I'm a black person in court and I call a white person a liar, I'm not going to win even with all the evidence on my side because you're not to show the faults or the failings of the dominant elite or the dominant system. And Marge has made it her career of exposing the naked, corrupt, corrosive rear end of the Anglo-American empire. And people can't be happy. And I can't emphasize enough that press TV, I wonder sometimes if you understand how important your work is, that the work of Marcier on the Trayvon Martin issue changed racial relations in the United States unlike anything since the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. Marcier and Press TV have literally changed this society, which is why they don't want you on satellite, on the hot bird. This is why they make it difficult the information that is liberating, as well as educational for a public that is starved for truth and a different perspective, she has defied our very powerful weapon of our media here, the conglomerated racist Anglo-American media that can justify the, the murder of hundreds of thousands of Syrians, starving 24 million Yemenis, and, and I can go on and on, droning, killing people in Waziristan, killing people in Afghanistan, literally having heroin and other drugs dumped in Iran and the Russian Federation to harm people. When this is exposing, many people here would never know this if they watch what we call the confused news network. Which, so what people have been getting from uh, press TV and from Marcia Heshimi among many other fine journalists that you have, is liberational information that's counter-hegemonic. And once you start watching press TV or RT, um, you can't watch American news anymore. They're, they're afraid of the fact that there are many American people that want to know what the world thinks outside of this Zionist-controlled or Anglo-American-controlled media that only likes talking to itself. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. Randy Short, historian and human rights uh, activist, a personal acquaintance of uh, our colleague, Marzia Hashemi, who's been entangled in uh, mm, that situation since uh, Sunday. She has been arrested. Uh, if uh, you are watching Press TV as of now, let me just uh, uh, mention again that Marzia Hashemi, an anchor person here at Press TV, an American Muslim woman, for that matter, has been arrested uh, in her home country of the U.S. Uh, that happened on Sunday in St. Louis Airport. Then she was uh, taken by the FBI to a facility in Washington, D.C. And uh, for 48 hours, 